the print of the cuff presented by IIFL Wealth and Asset Management corporate partner AU Small Finance Bank Hello and welcome to this edition of Off the Cuff Today we have a very special guest with us Israel Ambassador to India Naur Gelong thank you so much for joining us Thank you for having me Ambassador what does it feel like being the Israeli ambassador to India from probably the smallest big country in the world to now almost the biggest big country in the world it's a wonderful sensation i must say that uh, when i landed in india just over a year ago it was my first visit ever to india uh, it's the third time i'm an ambassador i've been to italy and the netherlands before uh, and i've been a diplomat in many friendly countries around the world uh, including the US and i must say that the the popular support to israel here is second to none and this is very unique so the popularity the support for israel the love for israel uh, a lot of work a very busy country a uh, people are proactive so while in europe people are a bit more reserved here people are chasing their the fortune i mean they want to to do if they want something they will try to get it in a proactive way so i'm really approached by the lot very very busy are there some similarities <clears throat> no to tell us some contrasts in the way the <clears throat> israelis think and function in day day to and we indians to i think that the cultural similarity are two elements that i always uh, think of one is the centrality of the family in their life so also in israel the family the reunion family reunion once a week on the shabbat around weekend is very important and all our reunions are around food so the centrality of food <laughs> and family together these two elements are very similar on the other hand israelis are uh, i think are a little bit more straight and aggressive in a way it's not always culturally it's not always accepted in in a understandable way because of difference of culture but otherwise i i would say that when uh, we, i went with jay shankar last year last october to visit israel uh, prime minister then was uh, bennett and bennett had his exit in new york in nasdaq and he had his company move to new york uh, and he told uh, uh, he told the foreign the foreign secretary the foreign minister that uh, when he was there uh, the the there were many nationalities in the company but the two who got along the best with the indians and the israelis because there are many similarities i see that also in the us i met now a group of uh, indians uh, indian diaspora from the us very well off people they came now also met prime minister and here and but i had a, a with american jewish committee i had also a session with them and you see how close they feel to the jewish community so there is a lot of similarities i think in in the dna of the two peoples i hope you are aware that in israel there's a cricket league that the indian south african and british origin jews run i am aware of it uh, we uh, you know these sports it started with baseball right. by the way but baseball is not a natural sport to israel and then what happened in one of the championships that there were there are many uh, Jew, jews american jews who are playing in the second league in the major league in the second league in the us and they didn't make it to the cut to the american american team <laughs> so they went to play for the israeli team and suddenly the israeli team is one of the better in the world so i know i know about cricket we are not yet one of the better in the world uh, but uh, because there are not enough jews here probably playing in the leagues here but uh, yeah i know that but we've come cup. a long way from a period when india <laughs> would not play in davis cup against israel yeah right uh, times have changed so given those changed times uh, you've also had a unique experience for an israeli ambassador uh, you must be the seventh or sixth ambassador mm -hmm. since we upgraded our relations mutually i never counted so, uh, like that yes uh, I, I, and israeli ambassadors tend to have long tenures so you better watch it uh, <laughs> in india uh, we don't let you go easily so this you must be the first israeli ambassador who's had to deal with a controversy uh involving israel or an israeli what are you referring to i am referring to what happened with this uh, movie ah, ah okay okay i i'm not sure i'm not sure i'm the first one but you know the history better than me you know? yeah so uh so how did it come at you and how did you handle it um 
You know, I went to Goa for the International Film Festival, festival in a very good spirit because uh, there was an effort to put forward Israeli, in Indian-Israel cultural cooperation. They brought uh, the cast of Fauda, Leo Raz, yes. the star, Doron. In the, yes, and, you were promoting that on uh, yeah, Twitter, yeah, I and, saw, yes. And people were, by the way, for, from the day I arrived here, from the first press conference we did together, uh, the questions about Fauda and Doron, when will you bring him in? And eventually he was here. So the whole thing was in a very good mood, uh, good things. And then, you know, in, in the evening was going wonderfully, speaking of the cooperation, the love, the closeness, the cultural closeness. And then, uh, unfortunately, a guy who is uh, identified as an Israeli, although he lives in Paris regularly, he does not live in Israel, uh, said what he said, and uh, the rest is history. But he may not live in Israel, but he spoke like an Israeli. Yeah, he, yeah. he, was, he grew up in Israel. So the culture of speaking straight, as I said before, being very straight shooters, uh, as I said, not always uh, understood in a, in, a, in a well way, in a good way. So, Pierre, you <clears throat> were in Israel just recently. Uh, yes. Did you find Israelis as argumentative as us in India, more or less? Yes, I'd say they're pretty straight shooters. Mm -hmm. and But it's very interesting to speak to them because they would always try to back up their points, you know. I don't think it's just statements that are made like so, that. Have so. you seen an Israeli ever lose an argument? Yeah, of course we lose arguments. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I lose every day on the argumentation with my wife, so you know. That's, uh, so, that's, uh, that's okay. That's, no, uh, that is still an Israeli's very. We, so. we are very argumentative. That's part of being the startup nation and the success in innovation. Part of it is being discussing everything in the open. So, you know, people uh, make you think another time about your. If, if no one contradicts you, you are sure that you are right. But if people will start contradicting you and arguing. You will rethink and maybe you will find the right path if you were not on the right path. So it's part of a DNA for the good and also a little bit sometimes for the less good. Yeah, so I, I tell people that if you want to see how argumentative Israel is, go to a sizable Tel Aviv bar <coughs> over a weekend and you, then you know. Uh, we, say, we say in Israel, uh, every Jew, two, two opinions. So seven and a half, seven million Jews in Israel. Uh, probably 14, uh, thousand, uh, 14 million uh, views. So that, that's right. We, <laughs> we, we, it's part, but look, it's also part of the biblical. If you look at historically, where did it come from? Biblic, you know, the studies of Bible is done in such a way because you have a text that is not 100% understood. It's an old language and it's sometimes ambiguous. And then they start debating on the text, what did they mean? They meant that or they meant that? So, mm. and they're in a big part of our Bible is also a, an oral Bible, they call it. So it was written late, later, but it's, it's not the written Bible, the first one. So it's part of the DNA of the Jewish people, I think. Well, that's also the tradition uh, in India, the Hindu tradition, which is called Shastrarth. So you see any line from a scripture <clears throat> and then you argue and you can come to blows and then the sovereigns, uh, held these arguments in front of them and uh, and they made sure uh, one didn't kill the other. Uh, were you surprised by the reaction that the pushback that you got from the Indian public opinion on this? Yes, in a way, yes. Uh, I was surprised because for me it was obvious that this guy is an individual, has his own opinion like every Israeli has his own opinion, as we said before. Uh, I didn't know the guy before. Uh, he is very critical of Israel, by the way, also yes, of the government. Yes, yes. He's critical. He's critical of certain directions, I think, that uh, he sees that he doesn't like in the world and in Israel and uh, all around. And yeah, I was totally surprised by the fact that people, for them, uh, this guy was Israel and Israel was this guy. So as if he's saying something, uh, now I have to be responsible for all nine and a half million Israeli citizens for what they say around the world. And you know, and I know that India is in population is 150 times, 140 times bigger. So I think you know it's very hard to be responsible for everything anyone says around. So I was a little bit surprised. Of that. But were you also surprised by the uh, by the uh, understanding, popular understanding about Israel, Israeli life, Israeli politics, Israeli debate right now today, and also Israel's <coughs> history, uh, history, the Holocaust. You know, uh, yes, I think that uh, uh, the Holocaust is, a, for me personally, is a very open wound 
Uh, my father was born in Germany. He is a Holocaust survivor. It's a long story uh, of the family. At the end of the day, he found himself in Budapest in the ghetto. Uh, my grandfather was murdered, but now my brother did. Uh, on my heritage, there is an Israel, now American company who does, you can do your family tree online. And my brother did it. And I, just when I saw the family tree that my brother did, I saw how many of my father's family, everyone disappeared. So the whole family was wiped off. Uh, what happened to the Jews in the Second World War? You know, the Jews, atrocities against Jews from, they, they were everywhere all, apart from India. They were all around the world. Uh, you know, Inquisition in Spain, uh, all around history. They were, uh, Muslim countries were usually better, typically, but also in Muslim countries, they, from time to time, they, you know, something came up, and uh, in, 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 in recent history, relative recent history, in 20th century, the Faud in the, the riots against the Jews in Iraq, so it happened all around history, but, and, but the Holocaust was something totally different. The German machine uh, did a systematic killing of the Jewish people. They concentrated them in camps. So what happened in Budapest, the story of my family, for example, the uh, extermination, extermination of the Jews of Budapest, of Hungary, started one year before the end of the war. Because in other places, it started in earlier the sure, 40s. Yes. And there, they concentrated all the Jews, so they were very effective in executing them, sending them to... to uh, and what they did, they sent them to death camps and uh, just burned, you know, burned them or killed them with gas or different ways, but usually gas and burned them bodies because to, uh, not to have to deal with them. Uh, in, in, so it, it was... My grandfather, by the way, it was towards the end of the war, he didn't even get to Auschwitz because the uh, Allies finally bombed the train rail. So somewhere in Austria, from Hungary, somewhere in Austria, they were taken off and they did what is called the death march. So this was a systematic killing of the Jewish people in an industrial way. It was not here and there riots and inconvenience. One third, six million people, one third of the Jewish population of the world was exterminate, uh, exterminated. And that is horrendous. You know, in places like the Netherlands, where I said before, it's like 95% of the Jews, 75% uh, uh, of Jews uh, died. So, it, you know, the numbers are, are terrible, terrible. And it, for me, when people start, you know, saying, ah, if uh, you say that uh, Kashmir is not uh, founded, so maybe Holocaust is not founded, and so it's not connected. You know, people have, each one has his own, issues, his own tragedies, his own history, and they are historically, factually based. And shouldn't be, you know, it sh they shouldn't come into an argument, doubting, if you doubt, I doubt. So this was for me, again, as a son of a Holocaust survivor, this was really, uh, I was taken back by it. Yeah. And also, all tragedies are bad, but all tragedies are not similar. Each one, I, but I, I, you know, I don't want to measure the pain on people on one, you know, for the person who had to to leave his home, uh, whether it's Kashmir or whether from Arab countries, for him, it's, it, that's, the, that's the life. That's the, that's the biggest tragedy that can happen. The story of someone else who was, uh, God forbid, raped or killed, it's the story of someone else. It touches you, but it's not your story. So each one, I, I would not go and measure the stories. By the way, speaking of the Jews who had to leave Arabs, you know, after the formation of the State of Israel, the Jews from now, you know, who lived in Arab countries, in Muslim countries, Arab countries in Iran, for many, many centuries, they, and better and worse, they used to pay the taxes of non-Muslims and live relatively in, under protection. They, they started to put pressure on them, sometimes local rights of the people, sometimes uh, others. The, what people don't know about the numbers, by the way, that 850,000 Jews escaped the, these countries uh, without their property. Most of them had to leave all their property behind in order to save their lives. And by the way, the figure is bigger than the figure of Palestinians at the same time who left uh, what is now Israel. Uh, uh, and no one speaks about it because there is a different narrative. Because for us, we saw uh, the young Jewish state, so it's a blessing, the fact that Jews from the region are coming into the country. We were fighting to build a country for our lives. While in the Arab world, they wanted to keep the, they didn't want the Palestinian refugees and they wanted to keep the Palestinian issue as a problem. So different narratives, how Bigger numbers, you don't speak about the Jewish refugees because we did not treat them as refugees. We treat them as brothers coming home. Yeah, but that's, you know, narratives. I, I saw your tweet on this, I think, just a couple of, day, a couple of days back. Pia, yes. you want, yes. want, want to take this forward? 
Yes, I would also like to ask you a little bit about, you know, India and Israel's defense cooperation. <coughs> As we know, um, Israel has really partnered with India to bring us the Barak 8 air missile systems, amongst other things. And you've also very much contributed to, you know, our Make in India initiative as well. Mm. So, um, I, I also wanted to ask, you know, what is Israel's cooperation with India? Where, where do you see it in about 10 years? Where do you see it in 20 years? So, yes, we have very intimate uh, cooperation on defense, and we had it before we had full diplomatic relations even. So, <clears throat> that, that's part of the interesting basis, I think, of the friendship and cooperation between the countries. What is very unique in our cooperation is the fact that uh, uh, there are really no limits uh, from the Israeli side on cooperating. You know, you have to trust someone in order to cooperate on defense, because when you cooperate on defense, when you sell the systems that are used by you, Israel, by the way, in a perfect world, would not export its systems because it exposes capabilities, vulnerabilities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we use them, these systems in order we develop them to protect mm. ourselves. It's not theoretical in Israel; it's used. But we do with selected countries, India among them, very few countries that we are ready to expose all our capabilities. We are almost all our capabilities. India is there. Mm -hmm. The level of trust is very high on both sides. It's not one way; it's both way. And uh, making India that you mentioned is a big challenge for all of us. I think that, and I heard it from Prime Minister Modi, that he believes that, uh, he said it to our Minister of Defense, that he believes that Israel is uh, the, probably the, the, the optimal partner in the making India because we are so intimate with each other. We are so together. I think that uh, uh, the potential is big. India has to understand what it wants out of itself on the making India. So beyond, how do you take the, the slogan and make it into reality because it's not hundred never hundred percent make in India. Mm -hmm. But how mm -hmm. what do you make in India? So it will be significant that there will be knowledge transfer to India, not only working and assembly. So all of that we are uh, Israeli, and drones now as well. Drones now as well, and uh, the the main is major Israeli uh, companies here mm -hmm. uh, already have more than ten joint ventures with Indian companies. So uh, in general. This is, uh, we are preparing for the time that uh, we can go together and fast track uh, on making India. So I have a connected question, Manoj Kumar Lal, who's from the police, <coughs> Indian Police Service. Uh, it's a long question, I'll shorten it. Uh, he says in this uncertain world, what are common challenges and points of convergence for India and Israel? Has time come for Israel for making deep investments in India on cutting edge military production to make Asia more stable? Since nobody's trying to make Europe more stable anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, again, I think that the cooperation is already there. There are already the joint ventures. We are already, Barak 8 is one of them, mm -hmm. but we are already doing many, many projects. We don't speak about defense in general yeah. because it's sensitive. It's always sensitive. You know, when we speak about trade figures, for example, India and Israel reached last year, according to your figures, $7 billion, which is a very nice figure. 7.86. 7. 7. Point, okay, over 7, 7 billion. Uh, it's excluding defense cooperation because it's never there. We don't speak about it. But in general, we are there. We are cooperating on the most sensitive uh, systems because we have joint threats, because we both uh, deal with terror, uh, each one with his own kind of terror, but terror is terror, and the systems of fighting them and mainly gathering information, stopping fina finances and all that is there. We do the same. We share practices. We share uh, even physical, how do you confront it physically when you have a terror attack? How do you negotiate? How do you do the, you know, the, the, the first interference and et cetera, et cetera. So we are very intimate on, on these issues. So there's Jadip Gadhvi who wants to know what would be the major agreements and disagreements between India and Israel regarding China? Uh, well, I'll tell you what is the Israeli position regarding China. Uh, we acknowledge the importance of China in the world. For many years, China was uh, a, a partner in many ways for quite a few years because of different circumstances. China uh, and Israel are not trading on uh, defense anymore. This is not part, but civilian we are. At one point, there was a very, uh, very close discussion on developing a fighter aircraft. 
or essentially producing an Israeli fighter aircraft in China. There were many discussions, nothing, no, nothing not, came, not out, came yes. from Futation, but we're speaking 30 years ago. Yes, think, yes. More yes. or less. So, yeah, we are, we are uh, doing a lot of civilian cooperation, I mean, trade with China, um, industrial, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that's more or less, I guess. Uh, where Israel is also part of China's Belt and Road Initiative. Yeah. The Haifa port was also built with Chinese investments. How do you see, um, given that the US is a very strategic, critical ally to Israel, how do you see um, Israel balancing this relationship with China? Uh, first of all, Haifa port is going to be Indian control. The Dani got the port. Yes. There is a, not developed by China. There is a small part that China took there that will be under a Chinese company took, which will be under Adani now, for the next 50 years, I believe, is the tender. And we are very happy. And by the way, the fact that the Adan, an Indian company is getting, it's a very strategic thing for Israel. We have two Mediterranean ports. And we are, in many ways, we are an island country. Because we have neighbors, physical neighbors, but the uh, ability to move, to go towards it's the neighbor limited, is yes, limited. limited. So our, our exits are two. To the Mediterranean and a very problematic one to the Red Sea towards India and Asia and that direction. So it's a huge, huge uh, uh, trust in India to give the whole port to an Indian part, a company. I see it on the good way. Uh, there is no doubt about the fact that the US is the number one ally of Israel, is the biggest supporter of Israel, always have been politically, economically, otherwise. Today, uh, Israel is developed, and I think that it's much more balanced, the relations between Israel and the U.S., because we are becoming also very strong assets for the U.S. We are selling the Americans' weapon system. We are developing together, but really in Israel, and then selling it to them. And we are doing, I think the world has changed. The contribution now of Israel to the U.S. back is already quite significant. Although the Americans support us uh, with $4 billion a year uh, in the ability, in, in credit, really, to buy in the U.S. Uh, weapon systems. So... The U.S., uh, uh, we will always consider the American position on many things. And I'm very happy that, uh, at least on the Indian front, U.S. is doing the utmost, I think, to get close to India. So the interests here are really the same. Aligned. 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 And, and this is very helpful, I think, also uh, for us. So, Ambassador, uh, <clears throat> given how much goodwill uh, Israel has in India, vice versa, uh, are you surprised, disappointed by... Uh, but I would say, do you find India's popular, un, popular at popular level understanding of Israel, the Holocaust, the history <coughs> inadequate? And you think those gaps need to be filled since you are an Israeli diplomat? No, it's, in, in general, we live. I, I think in general we live in a in a generation where knowledge is uh, is much more flat, it's much more shallow in the world, because uh, in the past uh, there were less attractions to the people, less sources of information, more you used to deep into books if you want, encyclopedias at the time when we, we were young, things that are unheard of in houses today. And we, you know, we are, we live on a very fast communication, short communication, people have no patience. So, and, and it influences also the depth of, of knowledge. It's not only about Israel, I think it's about all. And uh, we see that in social media, you get alternative realities. So. You know, there is no one historical fact anymore. Now, every historical or every fact is debated because everyone has their own truth. And it's a change of things around the world. Uh, again, there is some knowledge about Israel. Always, I would love people to know more about Israel. Uh, my experience, by the way, that most people, it was also in Europe, but I hear it also here in India, that when people go to Israel, usually they're even positively surprised. So what they heard about Israel was not even getting close to what the reality they met on the ground, which is a very, it's a very vibrant, young, very small country, but very energetic, uh, debative, you can say, but uh, debative going forward. And, and I think this is, uh, uh, this is the good part, I think. So, so the right may be the dominant uh, polity because, you know, all combinations, all coalitions generally tend to be right of center. But right does not control all of the argumentation in Israel. No, no. Uh, we are, again, very, very uh, uh, argumentative society. Everyone has their opinion. You cannot block anyone from their opinion. And that's why also when people tell me about this uh, guy, uh, Nadav Lapid, 
why didn't you quiet? We cannot quiet people. It's, there is no <laughs> way to, you know, people speak their minds and, and we le let, learn to live with their criticism. I mean, they criticize our government, governments. It's not this or that government. Our governments are criticized because there is always opposition. The opposition will always see its job as, you know, discrediting the government and attacking them and people have their opinions. Israel today, I must confess, is quite much divided politically. Uh, it's, it's mainly around the Prime Minister Netanyahu. So the people who are against and for him. And each camp, it's a zero-sum game. feels that, you know, if the other camp com comes in, it's they lost everything in life. Now everything is... And it's not like that. Life is much more sophisticated. There are things that are going to go one way. There are things that are going to go another way. That's life. We, you know... And in your country, everybody's majority is at the most by one or two, right? <laughs> it's in recent history that we right. turn to be very, very much like that. Too many parties, probably, political parties, although mm. we have a threshold. Right. So out of 120 members, the minimum is four members of parliament. If you get only three, you don't go in. Yes. And, uh, and yet we have too many parties and we are too much divided there. And it means that the, the biggest party now, the Likud, is just over 30. So it's one fourth. And they have to make coalitions. It means that the people, in order to reach the coalition, mm -hmm. the power of the smaller parties in this system becomes great, much greater than their effective power in the polls. Because it doesn't matter if they have six mandates that you need in order to get to the coalition, the majority, you will have to accept what they ask from you, or the majority of that. So it's a very complex system in Israel, uh, the coalition building. Yeah. Uh, so the couple more <coughs> stereotypes about Israel, uh, which I think the Israeli ambassador should talk about. One is the general view that Jewish people and Israeli people are essentially and deeply suspicious of Muslims. Islamophobia is an expression that's used <coughs> often. I, it's a generalized term, but but are people of Israel? Is this is the establishment of Israel? Are Jewish people generally anti-Muslim? Yeah, you, you, you cannot speak, uh, of course, in the name of all uh, Everybody. Israelis. It's very hard. But I think that the majority of Israelis, they have no problem with Islam as such. There is no such problem. We have about 20% of our population is Muslim in Israel. That is and the they, Israeli, uh, Israeli uh, Muslims. The Israeli uh, Muslims. Uh, not, uh, not, no, no, not I'm speaking inside. Because we are speaking about Israel. these Muslims <coughs> in Israel are equal citizens. Uh, they don't have to do military service unlike all the rest, but they can volunteer. And many of them, not many, some of them do. They have their own political parties. And last time, uh, we had uh, uh, Muslim ministers in our yes, coalitions the, for historically the, the left uh, leaning the, the parties. Arab, Labour list, Arab list got a bunch of seats the last time. Uh, yes. Yeah. So we had tradition in the Zionist, so called Zionist parties. We used mm -hmm. to have ministers from Arab, uh, uh, from Muslim origin. But uh, now, last time, last election, the previous elections, there was a party, uh, Ram, which uh, went into the coalition without taking ministerial jobs, but they went into the coalition. So the coalition wouldn't have happened without them. So they are much involved, the Muslims. You go to Leumi Bank, I think it's probably the second biggest bank in Israel. The chairman is Muslim, high court uh, people. So Muslims are in integrated in society and there are even laws uh, in order to do uh, favorable minority advancement. So, you know, as if to take the, my, the it has, it has a name in English, which I forgot. Uh, but the preferential treatment in order, if you have two people are equal, you will have to take the one who is not Jewish in this, in order to, you know, to in public service to make it a little bit more equal. Uh, we have ambassadors, we have diplomats, Muslim diplomats, we have Druze, other minorities. Again, we do have a conflict, a political conflict, and we try not to treat it as a, as a, as a religious conflict. And, you know, not all Muslims are terrorists. Unfortunately, in our case, all terrorists are Muslims, all terrorists that are attacking us. But again, it doesn't mean that all Muslims are terrorists. And we try not to make it, again, religious. It's not religious. It's a political dispute. There are many political disputes. If we make it religious, it's much harder to solve it. And Israel has actually made an outreach to the Islamic world. Uh, Netanyahu signed uh, Abraham Accords. Yeah. In general, I think that there is a, you know, for many years, it started with India. Let's, let's look at the Indian foreign policy and the change that, uh, that Modi brought to the foreign policy uh, towards Israel. I mean, the change happened in 92 when we established full mm -hmm. diplomatic relations, one can say, but this was a time that there was a wave of change 
because it was after the collapse of the Soviet Union, so we were in a sort of a unipolar world for a short time. And there was the Madrid Conference in 91, which took the countries of the region to, to discuss, uh, to be under, around one table. So we had these events, and India renewed uh, or established, I'm sorry, uh, full diplomatic relations with Israel, and then embassies and everything. And then when Modi came, uh, he brought with him the dehyphenation, what he called. He said, look, for years we supported the Palestinians. Not that we don't support the Palestinians, but we could not have our relations with Israel hijacked or in, you know. Yes. He, in uh, fact, he, he <coughs> issued a letter of support just the other day. Yeah, yeah. 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 And again, yeah. He, he's not, uh, there is no, in the sense of, it's not sending the Palestinians to, you know, go to. Right. And so they're keeping it, but our relations with Israel, our relations with Israel, our issues with the Palestinians are issues with the Palestinians. And this is a healthy approach. And I think, by the way, that uh, the approach that uh, the, Ar the Abraham Accords took, UAE, Bahrain, and then Morocco joined right. after, these countries said more or less the same thing. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, they have been supporting the Palestinians, these countries, in any way, politically, financially. They, they don't really see that the Palestinians are going toward approaching the state building element. So you put the money and you don't feel that what you get in return is going to, you know, it's an endless uh, thing. Because if you would see that they are reaching a state, uh, statehood, a state building a, a, a establishment, it will be easier. So these countries, I think that, and especially because of their fear of Iran, it was a big element there because uh, people maybe don't understand what's, how it's perceived in the Middle East, but Iran is considered as a threat to the Sunni countries. Most countries are Sunni regimes. Because uh, for years, the Sunni, Sunnis controlled the Middle East. All the countries were Sunnis, but Iran, and then all the Muslim countries. And then uh, Lebanon, de facto, you can say that they are under Hezbollah and, and, uh, and, and Shiite, uh, uh, Shiite uh, control. But, uh, you know, there was the Arab Spring and everything, and uh, the Iranians started to destabilize or help destabilize, support destabilizing of countries where, where Sunni countries and Iraq, after the American invasion, Syria, they are involved. In Lebanon, of course, for many years with Hezbollah, they're involved uh, in Yemen with the Houthis, and then from, Ye from Yemen, threatening Saudi Arabia and shooting at Saudi Arabia. Oil and, fields, UAE. UAE, and UAE. And UAE. Bahrain, of course, there was an uh, attempt of, uh, to, to topple the regime there. And uh, so, you know, all around that we look, uh, they are there also supporting uh, Palestinian, Palestinian terror organizations. So, Everyone is very uncomfortable with Iran, and I think more uncomfortable with the combination of this uh, kind of, of regime, extreme regime, and extreme belief, and nuclear weapon. I think this is already making a new ball game to the whole con concept, by the way. The question is not if Iran will the next day use the nuclear weapon. I think that using nuclear weapon in the, way to, in the world today is not an easy thing. Yes. But uh, think of it, look at North Korea, how... how you can feel protected what you can do. If you feel protected, the same policies you do now, you will do it 10 times stronger and destabilizing the Middle East and everything. And I think this is the uncomfortable feeling of the neighbors of Iran, and that's part of the reason they came. So, so they, they, they did the, their dehyphenation. They said, Palestinian issue that we supported for many years is still there and will stay there probably for years, but we need, we have interest with Israel and we want to do make them. Speaking of Iran, We've seen for the last three months in uh, massive protests across different mm. cities in Iran yeah. after the death of 22-year-old uh, Masa Amini. And now we're also seeing uh, criticism of the Iranian regime, for example, from the Supreme Leader's niece. We've also seen some of uh, the religious clerics also speak out, saying that protesters uh, have a right to come out and um, speak their mind. So how do you see the protests and what do you think? Do you think it will affect the leadership and the Iranian regime? Is it a major challenge and how do you see it from the Israeli perspective? I think that the Iranian people are among the most advanced people in the Middle East and in the world. So they are people who brought a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, information, data, knowledge, uh, developments. Uh, it's a rich society, unfortunately taken over by uh, a very dark regime. And this is a problem. This is a problem. I think that most of the population there is under, so suppressed under this regime. 
while they they're they're you know the liber the, the it's lib a very talented population mm -hmm. yes very capable population so no one is underplaying the Iranians we are not doing it either by the way it's not their limitation by the way is the regime I think they could have been much more successful in the world without this regime so they are you know they are struggling under a very strong regime very hard for them uh, I cannot predict where it's going because you know revolutions in the world are never predicted no no one new to say that tomorrow there will be a revolution. It's always an evolution that mm. leads to the revolution. So, you know, there are processes, processes that we saw already in the past that uh, the Green Revolution, if you remember in Iran, that there was an attempt by students and others, and, and it failed because there was lack of leadership and the two you know, uh, clerics, I will not go into it, Karubi and Musawi, were put in house arrest, that they were part of the regime, that they were perceived mm -hmm. as the leaders of this, adopted by the this uh, movement as, a, as, a, as their leader. So it's a very oppressive regime for its own population. And, uh, and some, from time to time, people are brave enough to come out and, and say that and shout and demonstrate and everything. They pay with their lives. That's like, when, when will it change? When will it end? I think that uh, once there will not be a reli having re religious people anywhere in the world ruling the country is not a good idea. We have to separate in general faith <laughs> and, and, and state. These are, both of them have to be respected and done, but you know, state has to go according to all the population and not according to religious uh, scripts that were written 3,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, 1,000 years ago. We, you know, we live in a real world and we have to, to, uh, to act accordingly. You have to, your politics has to deal with some of that lot, even in ruling coalitions, which want to stick by the letter of something written thousands of years ago. It doesn't happen. So there are people. Yeah, there are people who have. But this is democracy. You, in order to to have it happen, it doesn't happen. The legal system is not the biblical right. legal system. Right. So you have, by the way, we have in Israel, uh, apart from the, uh, so that's part of the compromises. How you, uh, for many many years, you, we have alongside the civilian, uh, the regular criminal uh, legal system or civilian legal system, there are family courts for family disputes for the Muslims they have the Qadis the, their own judge the Jews have their own rabbinical ones where they can go if they have domestic problems or disputes for example so they can also be discussed there what we a, call oh, as a civil court or exactly. yes, a family they, court but yes. it's, this court is under the civilian court so civil court. and mm -hmm. you can always go and to the high, high court of justice to the Supreme right. Court and appeal against, uh, against this so but you can go and discuss it there in this environment if you want or you can discuss it in the civilian, in civilian environment. environment. So we give an opening, but this is the compromise. That's what I'm saying, the compromises of life. Life is not black and white. You, you have to find a way to satisfy some of the needs of everyone. And you are so right with uh, <clears throat> saying that revolutions have uh, unexpected outcomes. Uh, because 1979 Iran, it's, there were several forces and several leaders uh, who, were, uh, who were in the revolution. It just so happened that finally one side won everything yes. they took all the spoils and winner take all yes winner takes all and uh, and and Khomeini came back and he took it and the rest now, is history as you yeah say. rest is history rest is history rest is also future let's yeah. see uh, mm -hmm. so uh, we'll not hold you for very long mm -hmm. there's a question from my colleague as young as her Raghav Bik Chandani uh, who says who's noted that Baku has passed a bill to open an embassy in Tel Aviv yeah. And uh, with this step, do you think that what remains to be, uh, what remains on the agenda of normalizing Israel's relationship with the Islamic world? So, leave, out, leave out Iran for now. So, w what is very unique about uh, uh, Azerbaijan is that it's a Su it's a Shiite country. Sh Shiite country. Mm -hmm. So, yes. it's the first Shiite country we really to establish. But we have wonderful relations with Azerbaijan for many years. We buy all our uh, most of our oil from them, a uh, Baku Jihan pipeline through Turkey to the mm -hmm. Mediterranean. And they so, buy some uh, some uh, drones uh, from you. A thing or two from us. So we have very good relations with them for many, many years. Uh, I think that the future where we need is the immediate, the closer, not the Central Asian countries, because with most of them we have very good relations, regardless whether they are Muslims or non-Muslims. Uh, our immediate neighborhood, so... Uh, you know, we have peace ag agreements with Egypt and Jordan, on Jordan, the two immediate ones. Lebanon is in a disarray. Now we agreed with Lebanon on the on the EEZ, exclusive economic zones, how to 
to uh, judge the, water, the, the water, economic waters of the border of the economic waters in order for, to enable French company, by the way, to, uh, to do excavation of, uh, of gas. Israel found quite a lot of gas and we want Lebanon to pros prosper, not under Hezbollah, but we want them because Lebanon is another good example. You know, in the 70s, before the civil war, you probably remember they were not born. Uh, uh, it was Paris of the Middle East. Absolutely, yes. It was a yes. very... People used to go there because it was very liberal and open and the feeling was, uh, you know, nightlife and, and very, very liberal. And unfortunately, again, you know, when, uh, when sec sectorial wars and the religious wars and the, everything goes bad. And th this is what happens there. So I, our hope, we have no real border dispute with Lebanon. The border is agreed there. There is one place or two places, but it's like two kilometers. It's not a dispute. It's not a dispute. Uh, it's an excuse, but not a dispute. Excuse not to do things. So with Lebanon, no problems. With uh, Syria, our other neighbor, unfortunately, Syria is uh, is not of control of its territory today. It's a split country. They are control of a certain elements ne next to the Israeli border. It's not the Syrian regime anymore. So it's very hard to to speak to anyone and to reach. And on the contrary, Iran and Hezbollah there are trying to build strongholds to attack Israel instead of from Lebanon to do it from Syria. Another story for another day. I think that the future is towards the Gulf countries. I would love to see the countries which are potentially countries like uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, like Oman, these countries there. I hope that it will be close. And the next group of Muslim countries who... I, I, it's very even emotionally very hard for me to explain why, for example, Indonesia and Malaysia are more extreme than the Muslim countries in the Middle East towards Israel politically. So, but this is, you know, Bangladesh, we don't have... Uh, so they, they are they're quite uh, all this, the Asian... The Pakistan, you did, Pakistan, you didn't mention. Pakistan, I, I don't think that the Pakistanis, by the way, also are looking at Israel. The issue, we, we would, you know, I don't think that Pakistan is... is again, it's, it's an internal thing. Always Israel is... It's very funny. In South Asia, so far away from Israel, Israel is an internal element in the in the political map. I think also in Pakistan. So these countries, I know didn't speak also about Afghanistan, but uh, you know, in these countries, somehow Israel is an issue. Why? Why? It's a tiny country, 22,000 square kilometers, so far away from you. Seven million Jews living there. Why? What? What? Why are we an issue for you? We should be, we should be friends. But that's the reality. Maldives also, by the way, no, no diplomatic relations. So. Why? Not clear, but this is the fact of life. And we want to normalize our situation, our position in the world with as many as possible. Uh, and I hope that, you know, we are on the way. I think we are on the way because the world is changing. We, uh, the whole, the old system is over. The, you know, we had a bipolar, we went to a unipolar, and now we're in a multipolar probably when India will play also a superpower role, I think in the years to come with the development and everything. And, and uh, shifting also to local, like the I2U to the uh, mm -hmm. India, Israel, US, UAE, yeah, right. uh, which is an economic, and the Quad, which is a military one, defense one. It's, you know, alliance ships now finding like-minded countries to, that can help you and can cooperate with you. Probably this is the future of diplomacy in the coming years. Yeah. Perhaps I would also like to ask you, since we're going a little bit back into Israel's domestic politics, um, when I met you two days ago, we were also speaking about how some Arab parties um, have also made strides electorally. Balad, which is one party which actually doesn't recognize the state of Israel, also um, did not j go along with its own coalition of other Arab parties this time in this election. But it did make a lot of strides. It was just shy of that majority. It didn't get any seats. <coughs> But how do you also see these Arab parties um, in future elections? If they came so close to that majority mark, what could happen in the next election? Uh, you know, Balad were in the past in the parliament, so you can take it to the other way around. If in the past alone they were in the parliament, why didn't they make it now? Maybe the line that they are leading, uh, anti-Israeli line, so they're doing it with, from within the parliament, working against Israel, this is a line that is getting weaker, I think, in the, uh, in the Muslim society in Israel. Look, uh, the, most of the Muslim minority in Israel, the, of this 20%, I think, are, uh, if they look around in the Middle East, they understand that their lives, they, li they live in the only liberal democracy in the region. Uh, financially, Israel, uh, per capita, GDP per capita, over $50,000 uh, a year. So it's one 
one of the higher ones in the world, a very developed country. And I think that their lives are good, most of them. Some people live according to their uh, nationalistic or religious uh, uh, approach, and they cannot accept the fact, but in Islam, Islam cannot accept the fact that uh, non-Muslims will control Muslims in any way, will rule Muslims. It's not unacceptable. Non-Muslims can live within a Muslim country and pay the, the head tax and live quietly and protected by the government, by the regime. Uh, and this is, it will not go away. They will always be so, the so, people. So they believe in that conservative view. Yeah, they are more conservative people. They believe in that. They, they don't think Israel has the right to exist, maybe. Some of them... Uh, some of them do think, but they think of another political solution. It doesn't really matter. But I think this group is diminishing. The fact that Ram, a party came and said, look, I, the Palestinian issue is there. It's not, they have their own leadership. They have the Palestinian authority. Our job is to represent our, the, the Muslim minority in Israel. And we will go into a government that will make sure that our lives will be better. Uh, invest in infra infrastructure, fighting, fighting cr organized crime. Uh, building more houses, uh, better education, better medical treatment. That's what they came. So you, that, that is the approach. This is a positive approach because they do, them, they do deserve, like anyone else, to get better. You know, also ultra-Orthodox parties, they try to make the lives of their voters better. Better education, better housing, less, pay less for the housing, etc., etc. That's legitimate. That's the political game. That's what you want. And I think that most of the Muslim minority in Israel are playing the game. First of all, are voting. Mm. 50, over, over half of them are voting to the Israeli parliament. It tells you something, I think. And, and this is part of the, of the game in Israel, and, and the good game. Because I think that at the end of the day, uh, we have to learn to live together. There is no alternative here. So, before we let you go to do more important things, two things. One, what is your message? And the floor is yours. What is your message to all these many Indians who are so angry uh, and who are so angry that uh, you, you mm. talked about getting a lot of DMs, uh, direct messages, and who are then raising questions about, rhetorically, about Schindler's List, mm. about Holocaust, and if you deny this, mm. we deny that. What's your message to them? I think that this, I, I said it at the end of my long tweet there, too long tweet probably for today's world. I never do such long ones, but I was... Uh, I was taken back emotionally. I think also I wanted to make a, the point very strongly. I think that the relations between India and Israel in the last few years took a very good turn, very good turn. They're in a very good place. And uh, Israel is a very pluralistic country. Each one has his own opinion. The fact that someone comes with his opinion out of the nine and a half million Israelis does not mean that Israel has this opinion. Israel is very supportive, very friendly to India. We understand the history. The history is not, you know, again, history is history and the facts are facts. And, you know, we are speaking of recent 20, 20th century history where the documentation and everything is there. So all the debate about that is, is not in place, not about the Holocaust and not about Kashmir. Everything is quite clear to everyone. So don't blame all the Israelis for the opinion of an Israeli. Like I would never blame all the Indians for an opinion of an Indian. And you are 140 times bigger in population. So, you know, the risk of an Indian coming out and saying something about Israel is probably bigger. So, again, the relations are strong. Let's play, stay together, not be emotional about, uh, you know, involving uh, disinformation or things. We are friends. We are strong bonds. And we will stay like that. And don't get carried away in, when we're not needed. Yeah. And... Uh... And uh, would you say that uh, there has to be better understanding or knowledge or sensitivity to what the Jews went through also? I think that there is knowledge and there is sensitivity, but it became very personal for people here who, and some of them, you know, and I said before, when you are the victim, when you are the one or your grandfather was kicked out of a place or had to leave, for you it's 100%. Or when a parent or an aunt were killed. It's 100% for you. It's not a, an if, something that might have happened to... For you, that's your life, that's your DNA, that's your heritage, you left your property there, or you, you have uh, people buried or burned there. Or, you know, so this is... It, it's very emotional, and I understand that. But the reaction has to be level-headed, not an emotional reaction, but a practical one in saying, yeah, but we are still alive. 
we are, have to work to the future of our people, the future generations. This is our responsibility as people, teaching them, informing, informing them. You know, it's, it's not new to, to say that uh, you must learn history in order not to repeat the, the mistakes or the other way around it said, but I, do it, I did it positively. You know, the people who don't learn history, they repeat the same mistakes. So I think it's very important to be informed and to take the decisions and, and this will eliminate, I think, uh, uh, some of the, of, the, of the misunderstandings of people. Yeah. So, in fact, all of us, uh, many of us read books. We have read books about the Holocaust, seen movies. But uh, once again, even for me personally, it was at one visit to Dachau, which was such an eye-opener. Uh, and the Germans have done it uh, efficiently. Uh, very efficiently, because mm -hmm. only, uh, you actually uh, go through the experience. And you figure it out. No, you understand how efficient the killing machine of the absolutely, Germans was. Absolutely. They were just bringing in trains to the gas chambers, to the crematoriums to burn the bodies. Day after day, day after day. It's, it's an amazing... People don't, don't understand. Men, women, children. It was not relevant who you are as long as you were Jewish. And by the way, also some other minorities. We have right, to remember right, that. The Romans. So the, 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 big, the, the biggest the minority, the biggest was the Jews, but and also gay people. So people were executed for being different than what the perception was of the what you should be Aryan or not Aryan never mind but so you know it, it's really bad yeah so in fact by the side of the Bundestag <laughs> there is a little memorial for other minorities that is the gypsies and um, and gay people etc that you mentioned yes yeah. so so maybe better understanding of each other's history and knowledge and maybe less instinctive anger yeah i agree so you you had your trial trial by fire now now i don't think no crisis is going to bother you that much I'm in my age and gray hair i had so many <laughs> trials in life don't worry I, i'm okay thank you very much ambassador thank, thank you you've been very generous with your thank time you. and you your patience much. thank you very much thank you the print of the cuff presented by iifl wealth and asset management corporate partner au small finance bank Oh, my God.